Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to live home in the community, Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, and Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Able Then On Air has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists. Welcome to this edition of Ableton On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lauren Seiler. And on this um, television program today, before we get to our uh, wonderful uh, guest, um, Senator Rebecca Ballant of Vermont, uh, talking about uh, gun control, uh, we would like to say uh, special thanks to our sponsors, Washington County Mental Health, Green Mountain Support Services, and many, many others, including the Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, uh, higher ability of Vermont as a partner, as well as many others. Welcome, Senator Rebecca Ballant, to um, Able Den On Air. Um, we're here today to talk about gun control mm -hmm. and the importance of gun control. Um, and there, in the news as of late, all around the world, um, there's been issues of school shootings, there's been issues of many situations with um, guns and, mm -hmm. and ghost guns and new things. Um, can you explain a little bit about, because um, I know that Governor Scott had passed a gun law. Can you explain a little bit about that and then we can go from there? Oh, happy to. Um, and thank you so much for, for having me. And for folks who might be watching, I'm the president pro tem of the Senate here uh, in Montpelier in the, um, in the state house, but I represent Wyndham County in the southern part of the state. And I mention that because the organizer, the founder of one of our best gun safety uh, prevention programs here in Vermont, Gun Sense Vermont, is actually from my home county. Her name was Ann, well, is Ann Braden. Uh, she no longer heads the organization Gun Sense Vermont, but she was really the one um, after the Sandy Hook massacre at the school. She was originally from Sandy Hook. And also Columbine, too. Ex exactly. And so um, she really was instrumental in uh, pushing all of us around the state to think more carefully about um, gun violence prevention. And so this most recent bill comes after a series of other bills that we've worked on in the last few sessions. And so the bill that the governor did eventually sign into law was S-4. And I just want to be clear that- um, Explain S-4. Absolutely. It had several parts. Um, one aspect of it was keeping guns out of hospitals. Um, we had seen an uptick in um, aggression and um, issues that could lead to violence in hospitals and healthcare facilities, and we felt it was really important to, to be really clear that guns did not have a place in hospitals, especially when nurses, doctors, families, everybody's just trying to get people well. So that was one aspect of the bill. The other was to give better protections for 
folks who are experienced domestic violence at home is making sure that there was a mechanism for removing the firearm from somebody who um, had been accused or had a history of um, domestic violence. And then it was uh, our push to try to close what we call the Charleston loophole, which is a way in which uh, guns can change hands, specifically at gun shows, without people having to have a background check run. And that, of course, is problematic. How, speaking about background check, before yeah. we get to my, yeah. uh, Arlene's questions, what, um, are there stronger rules within the law that um, because you know people uh, are mentally and physically challenged, mm -hmm. are there um, are are there stronger contingencies within the law? I think that's what word I'm using mm -hmm. uh, to make it harder for someone to get a gun if they have a mental challenge? Well, one of the things that I, I definitely would want viewers to know is that we we know that if you are someone within the disabled community or differently abled community, you are more likely to be a victim mm -hmm. of gun violence, a victim, a victim of violence in particular, not uh, more likely to commit violence. And I think in the media, there is um, this misconception absolute, around. It can be a dangerous misconception, right? That mm -hmm. people who um, are are dealing with um, mental illness are the ones that are perpetuating the violence, and that is that's not at all what the data shows. And so, what we're really trying to get at is making sure there are systems in place to prevent people who have a history of violence, not mm -hmm. a history of mental illness, but a history of violence, yeah. from. Uh, no, but do they have to take, obviously you have to have um, a background check. So what are some of the things that, if, okay, for example, if I'm going to get a firearm, yeah. what are some of the things that I would have to go through, a psychological exam, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, to get that firearm? And right. how it's strong is it? Right, it's, it, the, the best protection that we have right now is the universal background check push, is to make sure that anyone, because of course we are uh, protected by the uh, Constitution, the federal Constitution. Second you're, Amendment. Exactly, you're allowed to, um, as a private citizen, have a firearm. And so we have to be really careful that we are not impeding a citizen's ability to um, purchase legally a firearm. What we want is to make sure there are safeties in the system so that if you are trying to purchase one legally and it's clear that you shouldn't have one because you have a history of violence, that that should come up on a background check. And so that's why the Charleston loophole piece was so important to us because it essentially allowed guns to change hands without anyone having a background mm -hmm. check. So it was not flagged in that way. Okay, yeah. um, go ahead with your questions. Um, Take your time. I was teaching guns at a school but I was close to hand. Repeat the question, please. I was teaching guns at a school and I was close to hand. Okay. Now, I understand her question. Um, children shouldn't have access to guns mm -hmm. under a certain age. What... Uh, like, for example, if a parent is a police officer, mm -hmm. are there, like, they should keep it in a locked box, mm -hmm. obviously, because there's been issues with right. that. Um, uh, how are we keeping guns out of schools? Is there, are there ways that we're keeping guns yeah. out of schools and out of young children's hands yeah. that shouldn't have guns? I, I, really, I really appreciate the question. I have an 11-year-old and a 14-year-old, and I actually taught for a long time in public schools, and it was... Um, Your former teacher. Former teacher, exactly. And um, have seen really directly how the acts of violence perpetrated by, by students against other students and teachers, of course, it has become um, a horribly more frequent occurrence. And so you spoke really um, clearly a moment ago about the importance of having safe, safe storage at home. And that is definitely something that we have been uh, legislation that I that we've been trying to move here in Vermont is making sure that a a a, um, a child or a teenager living in a home that has guns does not have unfettered access to 
the guns and the ammunition. Mm -hmm. That has been a, a much more difficult um, including BB guns, including other sure. types of firearms. Sure. And yeah. so, as you know, uh, here in Vermont, we do have a long standing um, hunting tradition, and there are uh, there's a significant amount of pushback we've gotten from, you know, Vermonters who are part of um, the hunting uh, community saying that one of the reasons that we have guns in our home is not just for hunting, but it's also for family protection. And uh, we have had a very difficult time making the case that when you keep your ammunition and your guns together in the same place, or if you do not have them securely stored, all too often they fall into the hands of, of your children. And so that is work that we've tried to do in the past. We're gonna continue to do that work. Um, but it's, it's an interesting question that we struggle with. Is it better to go down the the avenue of much more education, right? Pediatrician to um, to family member, um, you know, guidance counselors and teachers to family, saying when we leave guns unattended at home, we know that we have or any other weapons for that matter too. Any other weapons, certainly. Um, I mentioned firearms in particular because we have a problem with suicide with firearms I wanna get to in Vermont, mm -hmm. and we're an outlier. Our, our you're, statistics, you're what? we are an outlier. Our statistics are higher than other surrounding states and other states who should be based on the number of guns in um, um, among the citizenry. We are still an outlier. We have more uh, work, suicides. More work to do. Yeah, we have more work to do and more, unfortunately, more uh, well, suicides. <clears throat> what are the, since we said suicides, yeah. and then Arlene will get back to your question. What, what is, uh, if you can give some statistics, I mm -hmm. know it's a horrible statistic, mm -hmm. suicide. Right. Um, how so, uh, how is it, um, what is the correlation between suicide and guns, you know? Right, um, as so. Far as the outlying statistic. Right, so one way to think about it is um, you have, um, you know, in, in any state, you have unfortunately, um, a, snip, a significant number of uh, people in any given year that try to take their, their own lives. Which is a horrible thing. It's yeah. a horrible thing. It's a terrible thing. When you have easy access to guns, we know that people who attempt um, to end their lives with suicide um, are more readily uh, able to complete that suicide if there's a firearm involved there's less of a chance of survival than if you were using some other means uh, in which um, to take your own life. And so that's why we've been very focused on this issue of letting people know, first of all, it's more young men that are impacted. It's more men. It's more men. Women uh, don't tend to use firearms um, when they are contemplating um, taking their own lives. And so what it means is you have what we call a higher rate of suicidality, but also of um, uh, lethality, because you're using a firearm as opposed to another means. What we also know in Vermont, we have higher rates of suicide um, by gunfire um, at, at um, the over 50 range for men as well. Oh, wow. And so there is a, l a lot more research that needs to be done, is it around is it around isolation? Is it around depression, feeling disconnected? But it, there's a gender component here in Vermont, and it's one of the things that I've tried to really concentrate on when I'm out talking to constituents, is that this is a healthcare crisis when it comes to men's uh, health long-term and mental health, and we have to be honest about You mean about depression that. itself, depression and, and other things. And when you about couple it with firearms. That's when, again, as I say, Vermont's an outlier. We have more people taking their uh, lives with firearms and, and more men here in Vermont. And so I, I really want people to be aware of that because it's often talked about in terms of, well, more women want uh, gun safety measures and, and more men want more freedom. This is often how it is very, like, um, very crudely talked about. And one of the things that I've always tried to do is push against that narrative and say, actually, 
we're trying to address this healthcare epidemic of suicide a young, a, a, among young men, but also um, older men of, of you know, older, old, I think it's over 55. And so it's, there are so many facets of this, yeah. and I think there's a lot of misunderstanding around mm -hmm. um, really who we're trying to help here, right? Mm -hmm. And it is, um, it's important to look at the details and not get caught in the rhetoric between the essentially the two camps, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not about restricting freedom, it's really about keeping people safe. Well, no, not restricting the Second Amendment, but right. making it stronger yeah. so people don't get their hands on guns who shouldn't, who shouldn't. have right. a yeah. firearm. Um, go ahead, do you want to ask another question? Yes, um, I don't think guns is of people who didn't have firearms and people that should, like, like, for example, law enforcement should carry firearms because... Yeah, um, yeah, getting to law enforcement, I think I understand her question. Yeah. Um, getting to law enforcement, there's been issues where police officers, now mind you, Mm -hmm. um, they're of authority and we should respect them. Mm -hmm. There have been issues of police officers making a mistake mm -hmm. and instead of pulling a, the taser out, yeah. they discharge their firearm, yeah. accidentally killing someone that yeah. shouldn't be killed. Yeah. Now there's, there's also another weapon that's less, less lethal that certain states are using, it's called a bolo. You push it, it comes out with a hook, and they, it wraps around the person, so it's not killing the person, it's just putting them down. Um, I don't know anything about the bolo. It's the yeah, first, I've, I'll, it's the first yeah. I've heard of that, yeah, it's really it's, interesting. Uh, I've done research on it, yeah. um, and we've done research on it, but um, our police are, are um, I hate using this word, and I don't want to use the word trigger happy, uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, but there has been issues mm -hmm. of police misusing their firearm. Are there are right. going to be laws against that in Vermont as well? Yeah, we have looked at the, the issue. I don't of, mean to use that word. Please. No, 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 I understand what you're saying. Um, there's, there's a number of um, issues there. One, yes, the, these high profile cases of officers uh, inadvertently grabbing their firearms instead of their tasers is, um, of course. We're trying course, to educate you, but yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's really um, absolutely tragic, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And what I think it often goes back to is the level of training that officers are getting around de-escalation. And, and, and that- And other forms of de-escalation. Exactly. Other forms of de-escalation and, you know, one of the things that I've heard from law enforcement um, for years in my job as state senator is what's been challenging for them in Vermont is because we have so much of a proliferation of guns generally in Vermont, and it was only recently in 2018 where we really had any restrictions on, on firearms. We were actually one of the most lax states in the nation about any kind of firearm regulation and they always felt like we are walking into these situations and we know in many instances we are at the disadvantage because we don't know who who has guns how many because the regulations were so lax now as we continue to do our work in the legislature to try to tighten up those laws it has to go along with uh, continued training that is looking more specifically at de-escalating these issues and uh, as you said not always to reach so quickly for the firearm and to use some other reasoning tactic like the the okay so the bolo mm -hmm. uh, similar to a spider-man's uh, spider-man's web you know yeah all right it, it's a it, it's a device you push it once a fish hook type of thing comes out and either it goes around the legs or the wow. middle of the person. So it's not, it's not uh, lethal. Not lethal yeah. and it's not killing them. Right. So um, yeah. 
de-escalation, like mm -hmm. for example, I'm gonna mention Washington County Mental Health. They have uh, their team two, yeah. where they put a social worker with a police officer, yes. and that's a l less likely way of right. de-escalating a situation instead of a firearm issue. Yes, whenever we can have um, folks from a mental health team embedded with police or or providing at the academy, at the training academy, additional <laughs> training about steps you can take before you get to that, you know, that crisis situation. Mm -hmm. That that's better for everyone. It's better for the citizenry. It's better for the officers. You know, it it is a very challenging job to mm -hmm. be in law enforcement. It can yes. be a very dangerous job, and I think it is um, it is always best for everyone concerned when there is training that is that doesn't start with um, the first reflex being meeting violence with violence is there a way to de-escalate but these situations they're so complicated and they're um, they're intense they happen quickly and so we really want to be able to give law enforcement the tools they need to be able to de-escalate in those moments and now in terms of training citizens with firearms um, if someone is going to get a firearm is there any special training that someone let's say if someone um, even though I don't approve of a disabled person mm -hmm. having a firearm but mm -hmm. if they need to protect themselves right. is there any type of training that they there's, can have there's certainly training available in terms of training being required um, nothing that I can that I can think of that being said um, so as we, I said earlier, I was a teacher for, for many years, and many of my students who were hunters who went uh, with mm -hmm. their family hunting, they all went through hunter safety courses. And we have a very robust hunter safety course um, system here in Vermont. And just wanted to give a shout out to all those instructors who take it very seriously. Um, in terms of a, a citizen uh, purchasing a firearm, um, there is no requirement for you to to complete um, safety on discharging that firearm. Mm -hmm. And so again, it comes up against um, your Second Amendment right to, to obtain it. But of course, you know, we as a legislature are always looking to do the least restrictive thing that we can do to make people safe, right? We don't want to prevent um, people who have um, the legal right and authority to be able to purchase a gun to yeah. do so, but we always want to make sure, to your point, that it's not being purchased by someone who really has a history of violence. And or, or a mental challenge, because for example, mm -hmm. Obama uh, and some other presidents have made it harder, like if, if a person gets Social Security um, or some kind of government funding, mm -hmm. Um, if they have a mental challenge, mm -hmm. they shouldn't be able to have, or um, they are making it harder for people um, to get a firearm. But um, again, it goes towards more education, and again, like you said, misconceptions right. that people can't. Is there any other types of misconceptions around? The gun, guns and gun violence and... Yeah, I, I really appreciate the question. Um, in the same way that we don't talk honestly, I think, in this state about the problem we have with suicide, I think we, we often don't speak as openly as I wish people would about our uh, problem with domestic violence. And that, you know, we... Whether, whether they shoot their partner or... That's exactly right. Oh, Violence, wow. yes. Violence in the home that escalates into um, death related to firearm. And mm -hmm. so we've passed um, a number of laws in the last few years really looking at that issue. Um, how do we make sure that, the, um, that law enforcement can get an order from a judge to take away a gun from someone who has been... Or revoke their Second Amendment right. Well, and that is, again, that is something that should be done uh, very carefully, since it is a, a, a you know a constitutional right, but that is that's really the crux of it, right? When 
someone has a history of violence and specifically against uh, their partner in a household, it shouldn't be easy for them to get that gun back, mm -hmm. especially as they're being adjudicated, right? Well, uh, define that, I'm sorry. So going through the, the legal process, mm -hmm. right, whether it is a trial, whether it is a case that's going to court, and so there's that in-between time, right? Somebody's arrested, they're accused of domestic violence or they have a history of domestic violence, and you do not want the gun to remain in the home and available to that person if they're out on bail or if uh, they, you see what I'm saying? There's that, what I think of as the, that, that very scary time for a victim of domestic violence when they don't know if something else is gonna tr trigger that anger again. And so making sure that there is a mechanism to get that gun away from the household. And I yeah. think that has been um, something we've been focused on for years and it's been su surprisingly challenging to convince people that actually that's a, the right thing to do. And, and it goes back to what I was saying before, when we have had hearings at the State House around these and other gun violence prevention issues, um, sometimes exactly. it's a sea of men mm -hmm. testifying in relationship to supporting gun rights and gun ownership, mm -hmm. and it's a sea of women coming to say, I was threatened by my spouse with a firearm or by my boyfriend or, you know, there is um, an inability right now, I think, for people to see the issue from another perspective. And that's some of the work that we've tried to do in the legislature for years is that it's really about keeping people safe. We're not trying to take away people's constitutional rights. Yeah. What are some of the uh, other situations with gun violence and gun laws that you are working on that people right. might be interested in? Yes, we'd really like to have um, a handgun purchase waiting period because we know that when somebody is um, feeling either uh, personally agitated, um, that's probably not a great time for them to be purchasing a handgun, either because they're going to take their own life or they may uh, perpetrate violence against somebody else. And so we have tried in the past to get a handgun waiting period. So you go to the, you go to the, the dealer or you go to the, uh, the store and you say, I'd like to purchase this gun. And if um, in, in, the, in the past you can go in and you can buy it same day. You can, you can go in, you can buy it and walk out with one. And we're trying to get at that, again, that very critical time when someone may be buying it when they're under uh, duress, when they're feeling anxious or angry about something. And if they're buying it for protection long term, then having to wait a day or two really shouldn't make a difference, right, what, to them. Like, yes, you're, you, can, you can purchase this firearm in a few days' time. We just wanna you know, have a waiting period to make sure that you're not buying it at a time when emotionally it's probably not a, a good, healthy time for you to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Um, now you're you've been in uh, the Senate for um, quite a number of years. Uh, I understand that. Um, you know, on another topic, you're r wanting to run, or you are trying yeah. to run for Congress. Yes, that's right. Can you explain a little bit about that and your work and sure. um, I, and w why you really left education, even though we're educating people. Yes, uh, I, loved, I loved being a teacher. I think I will always be a teacher in, in some way. Um, and my work as a teacher in the public schools here in Vermont really has shaped my work in the legislature because I worked in four different you know, public schools here in Vermont, different parts of the state, and I have a really good understanding of what families are going through right now. Mm -hmm. um, not just on these issues, but issues around the economy um, and um, looking ahead to the future of Vermont, are, are they feeling like they can raise their kids here uh, financially? Is it possible? Some for them people to do I've that? heard are leaving Vermont for better because, it, you know, taxes and other. Well, and it is a it's a very um, 
uncertain moment economically for people coming, you know, after two years of the pandemic. And so when I think about the issues that are really important to my constituents, certainly issues around gun violence prevention are very, very important. Um, housing, the cost of housing in Vermont is, is a big one. The cost of health care. So I'm someone who very much supports um, a Medicare for all model, making sure that mm -hmm. everyone has guaranteed um, health care and that it doesn't bankrupt them. And for example, the other day we had somebody on the show talking about universal uh, school food, you know. Uh, yes, for my meeting before this uh, interview was on that, actually at the State House. Yeah. And the food insecurity that food families Food insecurity are, issue, exactly. that's another yeah. um, issue that's important. Yes, mm -hmm. and so, and uh, on a sort of, um, uh, a more broad perspective, one of the things that really pushed me to decide to run to Congress right now is what happened on, on January 6th of last year mm -hmm. with the storming of the Capitol. Um, I think that we, as a nation, really Yeah, people need, really got violent with that. Yes, they did. Yeah. They got violent, and um, you've got people serving in Congress right now who don't believe in democracy. Because if they did, they wouldn't have supported the insurrection. And so um, there are uh, personal issues for me, as I said, related to the work that I've done with families here in Vermont that are important to me. And I also, I wanna make sure that our, our democracy survives. And um, I feel like I've done a tremendous amount of work here in the, in the state Senate. And I feel like some of the investments that we need to make um, on on a larger scale need to be done at the federal level. And Especially when it comes to services and people with disabilities. Yes, yep. absolutely. Yeah. All right, so um, so we would like to thank you oh my gosh, for joining thank you. us yeah. uh, on uh, this edition of uh, Ableton On Air. Um, for more information on your work and mm -hmm. where can people contact you? They can go to two ways. So on the congressional campaign side, they can go to BeccaBalant.com, B-E-C-C-A-B-A-L-I-N-T.com. Mm -hmm. And they can also go um, online to the Vermont legislature and go to the Senate and search for my name. And you can send me an email that way. Okay. Well, we would like to thank you for joining thank us you. on this edition of Ableton On Air. Uh, for more information also on Ableton On Air, you can go to www.orcamedia.net. That's O R C A. M E D I A dot net. Um, I'm Lauren Seiler. I'm Lauren. See you next time. Major sponsors for Ableton on Air include Green Mountain Support Services. Empowering people with disabilities to live home in the community. Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Able and On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, and Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Able Den On Air has been seen in the following publications, Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. 
the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists.